see if I pull up Twitch. Yeah, cool. We're live. All right, and so now I'll go ahead and tweet. Send that out. Can close that window now. And so I was thinking we'll kind of start out doing like, um, you know, the the business up at the top um, uh, and then go into uh, the book discussion. And then uh, I don't I didn't get a quote this time um, for a book. So like oh, at the okay. end, um, but I wanted to end by uh, just briefly like talking about another book that I had been reading this week. So oh, yeah. uh, I figure we can end on that uh, sure. as like a one more thing. <laughs> okay. But if you have a quote uh, that you would like. I do not, actually. I haven't thought of one. No, I did. Um, yeah. <clears throat> I had neither. Yeah, no, I haven't really thought of one, but no, that's fine. I do have a quote from the book that we've been reading. Oh, cool. But I mean, that would be that would be perfect. Yeah. Hmm. But I think it's it's more of a quote that will come up in discussion rather than one that's at the end. Of. But we'll see. It's showing my bit rate as being very, very low. Oh. So uh, I've got the stream up and it looks fine. It looks fine? Okay, as long as it looks fine for you. Mm -hmm. Okay. I will... Um... And shamelessly plug our stream. If oh, were. yeah. <laughs> the last thing I always, that I almost always forget to do. <laughs> Are you going to hit the discords? Yes. Okay, thanks. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, I believe there are some promo channels that I can use. Cool. Okay, I think I'm I think I'm all set. Um, okay. If you are. Uh, yep. Yeah, let me just. I think I've got everything pretty much. Bear with. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. I mean, the beauty of uh, of a podcast is that we can edit out anytime. You know, like if we need to stop or you know, those things could be edited out pretty easily. Sure. That's true. I think that's oh I haven't done it in yours hang on <laughs> live again I need to turn on streamer mode <laughs> otherwise we're gonna I'm gonna get the the dings Oh, 
Okay. Oh. <laughs> Oh, yeah, you see my... Mm -hmm. uh, there's okay. streaming mode. There's nothing really on show. No, yeah. I'm, yeah. Okay. Well, there'd be a bloopers edition of the podcast. There probably should be. Yeah. <laughs> Yo, what up, Survivor? Be that funny, though. <laughs> thank you so much for lurking, man. Appreciate it, and thank you for oh, the follow. Oh, there's something gone a bit weird with the... Uh-oh. How the cameras are fitting in the windows. Hi, Lee. No. Why would it do that? Looks like it needs to be bigger. It does. Okay. Ba-boom. There we go. Oh. How about that? There we go. Okay. Good deal. Um, what's up, Elite? How you doing? I hope you're doing well. Yeah. Pro streamer right here. Yeah. I feel like the the Twitch audience gets to see us like, you know, work through some of the the hurdles and <laughs> Yeah. Uh some of the pre podcasting, you know, legwork that needs to be done. All right, I'm ready. You ready? All right, let ready. Me uh let me make a note actually i can do that in obs uh doing doing well elite uh it's a really tough week at work um but i've really embraced the weekend uh this weekend to kind of relaxing recovering and recuperating and yeah so i've been good yeah i'm all right ish <laughs> I, I was saying to tim just before we started i've got i've got a bit of a sniffle which i think is just allergies um but yeah i've right. done that all good okay now i think i think it looks much better now okay Okay. Um, good to go. I didn't make myself a cup of tea, which I normally do. <laughs> when I say normally, which I did last week, and it was really nice having <laughs> a cup of tea in front of me. Right, right. Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Book Nook Podcast. This is episode one, where we are going to talk about Yay. Clara and the Sun. Um, by Kazuo Ishiguro, and uh, my name is Tim, and with me I have my co-host. I'm Claire. It's Hello, Claire. Everybody. Yeah. Uh, Claire, how was your week? It was good. Really busy. Yeah. As always. Finished the book this week. I oh, yeah. I finished it yesterday, <laughs> and I did read quite a lot towards the end of the week. I hadn't got as far through it as I wanted to in the beginning of the week. Um but I didn't rush it. You know, I had actually a really nice... It was actually really nice yesterday. Oh, good. Um, just chilling out for a couple of hours and reading. That was really lovely. So, oh, good. Uh, yeah, there's, yeah, I enjoyed it. I, so I, I finished the book last week. I actually finished it before we recorded episode zero. And mm -hmm. um, I messaged you at some point during the week, and I was just like... How's it go? Like, how's it going? And uh, I personally, mm -hmm. get, I'm so I'm a procrastinator. And mm -hmm. when, especially when somebody is depending on me, like for the book club, like to have it read, I put so much pressure on myself to make sure that I have it read. So I was like impressed with myself that I had it already read. Um, so I'm glad that you got it done. And I'm glad that it sounds like you weren't like up against the clock. No, no, I wasn't. I wasn't doing like an all night cramming session or anything like that. Um, and and we'll go into the book in a bit more detail. But um, yeah, I didn't. I I did struggle with it a little bit to start with. Mm -hmm. But oh, uh, we can talk about that a little bit more. But um, yeah, a little bit later. Sorry, but yeah, 
I, I wasn't up against it. I actually had a quite nice relaxing day yesterday, just reading, and it was really nice to do. And it was almost quite good that I had a deadline because it actually made me sit and read and do something that I actually like. So it was good. Yeah, that's awesome. That's great. Um, yeah, so uh, as Claire kind of uh, said, we will go ahead and get into uh, the book that we read this month. Um, I know that there are actually some community members that um, I spoke with yesterday that are still reading it. Um, and they said, well, I won't watch the live recording, but I will catch, you know, when I fin I'll catch the episode when they finish. And I was like, that's perfect. That's what we designed it for. You know, um, we know that everybody has different schedules and different times, uh, that they can devote to reading and life happens and you know, it, it'll, it happens to us too. So, um, we will attempt to be as consistent as possible so that uh, you guys can devour the content whenever you can. Yep, absolutely. Um, so we do have just a little bit of business to do up on the front end, and then we'll spend the rest of the time discussing uh, the book, Clara and the Sun. Um, so one thing that we just wanted to shout out is that we do record uh, live episodes on Twitch and our Twitch handle is the underscore book underscore club. Er, whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa. <laughs> That's, I'll have to edit that out. Not right? quite. Not quite. <laughs> uh, the underscore... <laughs> <laughs> okay, fresh take. Uh, we have a Twitch handle that we use uh, to record live podcasts um, that can be found at the underscore book underscore nook. Um, and when uh, when or if you do follow that channel and check out our episodes, um, you'll have the library of episodes that we've done in the past as well as uh, you'll be able to catch those live recordings and see all the um, inner workings of some of the legwork and some things that we talk about up front before the podcast even starts um, and we do a little chat engagement as well uh, when we can so uh, yeah Claire uh, anything else that you can think of regarding socials or um well twitter obviously we have twitter which is uh the underscore book underscore nook uh then instagram as well which is tbn underscore the underscore book underscore nook um <laughs> and i think that's it at the moment did we we haven't got tiktok or anything yet are we we're not that down <laughs> no. with the kids yet no okay. no uh that's interesting. I hadn't really thought about what that could, like, what kind of content that would be. But I do follow. I don't know about you, Claire, but I do follow some uh, book like related uh, TikToks. And oh, like, you do? I, didn't I do. Know there were any book related TikToks? I do. I can't I think of their all name. Silly but... dances. <laughs> I mean, there is a lot of dancing that occurs on <laughs> TikTok. But um, no, I that's actually i've gotten a couple of good recommendations um from uh an account that i follow um she reads a ton it seems like she reads like four books a week um and she really likes like the fantasy and sci-fi realm which it fits in perfectly with um you know some of what i like to read as well so um yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'm gonna need links. Maybe I'm gonna need links. Okay, okay. I will find that link and, and send it to you. I mean, I kind of thought, well, if we're gonna have TikTok, it could just be you and me doing stupid dances with the books in our hand or something. <laughs> I don't know. Right, that, right. That work. I mean, we could do that too. <laughs> maybe there's maybe there's an audience for that. I don't know. Um, Who knows? Maybe. <laughs> um, <laughs> But yeah, I think that oh oh one more piece of business uh, that I that Claire and I discussed um, well just yesterday actually um, we were attempting to decide on what books uh, what book to choose next you know for next month and in the past when we've done um, a book club we have rotated every month between fiction and nonfiction and we really liked that rotation um 
And uh, Claire, uh, you had asked me a question. What did you ask me yesterday? Um, it was something along the lines of, do, you, do we think that we could do two books a month? Two? And do a fiction and a non-fiction book. Yes. In yes. the same month. So two books a month, um, which uh, I think for our, our dear friend Hams might send him into an early... <laughs> crave <laughs> if he had to read two books in a month but um for for claire and i we were like okay let's i i personally was like i love the idea let me just think on it because i don't want to overcommit and under deliver you know so like um i want to make sure that i can do this if this is important to me it's important to you um and the more i thought about it the more i was like I think we could definitely try it out. We could definitely see how it goes. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to read one fiction book and one nonfiction book. And then as um, the audience, uh, Claire had a great idea that maybe, you know, you don't, as an audience member that wants to participate, you don't have to read each book. Maybe you choose one of them and mm -hmm. you just listen to us talk about the other one. Yeah. So my theory is, because I like aud audiobooks and I like physically reading as well. So I would put one, I would have one as audio and one as uh, a physical book. And I would pick whichever one worked that month. Um, and then the, the audio book, obviously, I listen to maybe a little bit before I go to sleep or in the car on my way to work or whatever. And then the physical book is going to be obviously something that I can read whenever. But um yeah the the idea is that you guys don't have to read both books right. and you might feel like one of them is really not your cup of tea you don't really fancy it that's fine you could read the other one or it might be that you only really read non-fiction anyway so you're more uh you'd be more interested in reading the non-fiction book or maybe it's the other way around and you actually prefer fiction and you'd love to join in every month but if that month we were reading a non-fiction and you really only read fiction then perhaps you know you would feel left out and mm -hmm. so yeah that's the idea is that we will we will read the base books and then discuss them and then you can you know join in with the discussions in the discord or in the twitch chat or wherever you want to join us really yeah absolutely so uh really what that means for the community is that uh more podcasts will will be recording twice a month um and uh we haven't exactly worked out like the um the timeline so to speak of like you know we're going to record on the second sunday of every month um but we are going to probably try to adhere to sundays in general um so um yeah so more to come on that but i think that that is the business uh that we have to take care of uh and Sundays feels right to me. Sundays it feels does. like a cozy cup of tea, fire on chat day. It does. So, I mean, I don't know about you, Claire, but the way that, like, my brain works, uh, Friday night, I am dead to the world. <laughs> like, after the work yeah. week, I'm just done. Um, I usually go to bed early. Um, and on saturday i'm like recovering i'm like decompressing from the week and then sunday i feel rejuvenated and i'm like in a good place to be able to do things adult again <laughs> yeah no i agree actually yeah completely um saturday is more of a fun day for me i tend to be up late play games mm -hmm. with people socialize you know all that kind of stuff and then yeah sunday is very much kind of a get up late chill out have a lovely quiet afternoon today is an exception i actually had to leave the house which is ugh, awful um <laughs> but <laughs> yeah we're uh, normally it's nice and quiet and i can you know watch a movie and read a book whatever i want to do in the afternoon and then yeah for me it's the evening now so it's like True. nearly half past seven so this is a really nice kind of tail end to my weekend and it's it's uh yeah i love doing this it's great I appreciate you being able to do it when you when you do because um, I 
uh, maybe some audience members uh, feel the same way, but I suffer from the Sunday scaries. Uh, mm. And my anxiety kind of goes off the rails around five o'clock <laughs> um, mm-hmm. in the evening. And from like five to 8 p.m., I really have to like give myself motivational speeches to like embrace what's coming for the rest of the week. So um, I get that, but I do get it later. I get it when I'm going to bed and I'm trying to sleep oh, generally on a Sunday. Okay. Yeah. Well, so yeah, if I can get tucked up in bed early enough, I know eventually I'll be asleep in time to get a relatively good night's sleep. But mm-hmm. yeah, I rarely sleep very well on a Sunday because I'm always slightly concerned about what's coming up weeks ahead. So yeah. <laughs> well, just a little bit more insight into who we are as people um, that you didn't ask for. <laughs> <laughs> Little bolts of anxiety. Right. <laughs> and with that, let's move on to our next segment Yay. that you probably care about more, which is uh, our book of the month. So we read Clara and the Sun uh, by Kazuo Ishiguro. And uh, I'm going to read just a little blurb about it. Um, and then we'll go ahead and dive in and talk about it. Um so, from the best-selling author of Never Let Me Go and The Remains of the Day, a stunning new novel, his first since winning the Nobel Prize in Literature about the wondrous, mysterious nature of the human heart. From her place in the store, Clara, an artificial friend with outstanding observational qualities watches carefully the behavior of those who come in to browse and of those who pass on the street outside she remains hopeful that a customer will soon choose her but when the possibility emerges that her circumstances may change forever clara is warned not to invest too much time in the promises of humans in clara and the sun or Clara, Clara. I will flip that back and forth, by the way. It's just... <laughs> it's fine. Yeah. In Clara and the Sun, Kazuo Ishiguro looks at our rapidly changing modern world through the eyes of an unforgettable narrator to explore a fundamental question. What does it mean to love? So. Mm. It's very interesting. Um... We chose. Is that the question? I have to ask this straight off the bat. Oh, okay, okay. Um, so, what what was that quote again? Hang on, I've got the book in front of me. It says, mm-hmm. uh, "What does it mean to love?" Is that the theme of this book? I mean, it sort of is actually a little bit, but I have some thoughts on that. Maybe we'll get into that a bit later. But oh, I, I love I, it. I, I, I have love it. Slight... Let's yeah. let's dive in. I love it because I I can feel the challenge that's coming. Um, mm. So I so I would say that uh, maybe in a broader context it is. Um, I found the the romantic love that uh, came later in the book to be one that I didn't completely understand. <laughs> um, so uh, maybe we can get into that when we talk about like spoilers. Um, yeah, a little the, bit more. that's the trouble. It's going to be a lot of this is going to be um, spoiler city. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to have to try and skirt around that for a little while and not not give out any spoilers. Yeah. Um, but uh, I'm not entirely sure the theme is really about what is it to love, although it is part of it. I think it's more about what makes us us. What makes us. Um, what is it within us that other people find to love and they, they can they love a facsimile of that mm. that is probably the theme so yes but i guess love is is part of that but i think it's more about soul and yeah uh, it, yeah id some of the inner workings of who we are um, and what comes up, I think, in question multiple times in the book is that Clara is uh, an artificial friend in this universe. And by that, um, she is essentially kind of like uh, an AI um, that has a physical form. 
And uh, so her consciousness is basically uh, a computer program, uh, you know, that was written. And so um, she is learning about the world in through experience by observing behavior um, and observing people. That's really um, kind of who she who she is and what she does um, in the book. Um, she, it must be in this world, kind of like a, a pet shop, you know, like that's mm. kind of what it reminded me of. Like you go down to the local pet shop and you pick out a pet that you really like, um, to be like your, your friend, your buddy. Um, mm -hmm. the beginning of the book very much felt like a Toy Story-esque, um, approach where like, yeah. I don't know, Claire, what did you think? That. Yeah, no, I can see that. Yeah, definitely. I think what I what strikes me with um Ishiguri's writing as well is that it's uh he kind of um writes things that don't really describe the situation accurately. Mm. Because and he writes from the first person as well, so that that would be why. Um but because uh, he's writing with that that uh, person's thoughts and they're in a monologue so it's not you know there is a sky and there is a tree and there is this is what this looks like and this is what this uh, this is um, so it was uh, it plodded along and eventually you kind of it, it, it became apparent that there was this almost like a department store with um because there were trolleys with things on and a glass case with things in and then there were these afs artificial friends mm -hmm. um and they you know had little personalities and talked to each other and had friendships and stuff within the store and a manager that looked after them and yeah it that all sort of unfolded as you went along reading it there wasn't um you know there wasn't a long bit of this is the situation that we find ourselves in and this is what it looks like. It was just, you know, it, it goes straight into story and starts being told and then you learn as you go what really what the hell's going on. I think, is that... Have I got that right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the... <laughs> the storyline and we will when we are going to talk about the ending of the book and like some of the maybe the major themes that we'll have to do some spoiler talk for we will put a spoiler warning in there so um if you're listening via audio you will definitely uh be warned before that um we'll do our best to keep it spoiler free but we are going to talk about the plot of the book um and some of the progressions that lead up and through um you know, midway through. So, um, Clara is, um, this, uh, robot that is kind of taking in the world around her. And at the beginning of the book, that world is very, very small. Um, it is basically just her in, uh, the department store. And it seems as though that she doesn't have a whole lot of freedoms, um, and when I said that it reminded me of Toy Story, it was because it was almost like they, the products or like the AFs, um, were put on display, but there was almost a semblance of like, you could only interact with humans if they interacted with you first. Um, and it, there was almost like this, like, you don't want to be seen as um uh having a mind of your own or like um uh, moving and 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 doing things without um yeah i don't know it was very very showy um and it wasn't really about like the demonstration of the afs at the beginning and mm -hmm. it was really like hey people are going to come through and they're going to look for an AF that fits with what they, um, the customer feels like they want. And then, um, you'll go home with them and you'll live with them and they'll take care of you. Um, until the, you know, until the end. Um, mm. and 
So that's what kind of made it feel like uh, like a Toy Story vibe to me at the beginning. Um, Definitely did. And also, it's interesting that the book was written about these artificial friends, and they're really children's yeah. companions, toys. They're for children. It's. Uh, I thought it was interesting that he chose that subject matter, and that you wouldn't go for a robot housekeeper or a robot. Um, right. A robot boyfriend or girlfriend. Yeah. <laughs> it was. It was a, a ro- It was, you know, and it seemed. You know, and the the discussion around it throughout the book was, oh, there's a child over there with an AF, and you see lots of children's AFs, and there's no other. There's a little bit of reference to other um, artificial intelligences, uh, particularly around um, jobs and things like that, factories and engineering and things like that. But um, there's no no other talk about domestic mm-hmm. uh, artificial intelligence apart from this children's kind of thing and maybe that's part of the theme of the book is that not everybody is very happy with the fact that there are artificial yes. uh, friends and perhaps that's uh, why that's having a child's toy kind of vibe is more easily easy to swallow than having other types of uh, robots I guess yeah. androids yeah, it, I mean, you're you're totally right. It almost seemed like, um, I don't know, Claire, when you were a kid, did you have a, an imaginary friend? I didn't, actually, but my no. son did. Yeah, it kind of reminded me of, of that, like... Yeah. Except that they're not imaginary. They are um, actually, like, um, you know, just as tall as another another child um and do you remember being very yeah. excited actually as a kid and not just about the imaginary friend but anything that could be almost real yeah i was very excited about so anything that, like a tam- tamagotchi, tamagotchi or a furby or something yes. that you had to look after or you know one of those babies that mm-hmm. screamed at you yeah or you know you had feed and stuff like that that one of those dolls that kind of thing i loved that because it, it was real same so that yeah i think that's a similar thing yeah i i definitely agree i was thinking the same thing i was like um i mean i used to when i used to like play imaginatively i used to pretend that like i had pokemon that you know like i actually had um and lived with me and things like that so um i definitely I, I get the same sense of like what the purpose of these AFs could be. And um, what ended up happening is that uh, a little girl in the book named Josie um, passed by the shop a uh, time or two and would uh, see Clara in the window. Um, they'd have like a little interaction, but the store manager would say like, don't get your hopes up. Um, and like in my mind, I was like, oh my gosh, this is going to be the saddest book in the world. Like I (laughs) can already tell, like, I'm not, this is going to be so sad. I just was getting like pet shop vibes. Um, so anyway, uh, Josie did end up, uh, coming at one point and with her mom and they, uh, almost picked a different AF, um, because there was like a new um, version of uh, Artificial Friends, uh, version three, I think, um, that came out. And uh, they were almost about to pick that. And Josie persisted and was just like, no, there was one in here that I really, really liked before. Um, And uh, the store manager, after giving a description, kind of recognized like what that would... um, you know who that would be and brought her over to Josie uh or to Clara and Josie and her mom kind of like asked uh Clara some questions and um what did you think about like the that process and the like selection I guess um I was kind of confused by it a little bit and again it was this whole thing where you read through the book and you get snippets of information you try and put the bigger picture together Mm -hmm. 
um, and that snippet of information was the mother's reluctance almost and when she asked Clara to walk a certain way um, and that kind of thing and it started giving little hints and clues as to mm -hmm. what the bigger picture was but at no point um, at that time did I have any idea that that's what was going on um, but uh yeah, I was slightly confused by it, um, and slightly confused by the characters and what what was going on there, um, and why it took so long as well. Like um, <laughs> Clara was in the window on display. Josie saw her, said, "I'm coming back to get you. You're the one I want." Right. And then it took weeks, it took and a long time. days, and yeah. it took a long time before eventually she came back and they they got her. But it was just a bit kind of weird. Like, yeah. why was it so long? And then also, like, where were they in the world? Because they don't really give. They don't really say. No, they really don't. Um, I suppose, like, I was, um, I think I, I like, I was imagining, like, a, um, I don't know, like, uh, an Eastern European type of a location mm. or um potentially I, I had it in my mind that it was somewhere like japan i was gonna say like maybe japan yeah. or um or or like a, a city in china maybe um uh, yeah yeah i was i was kind of thinking the same thing yeah but not like a not like a Tokyo where like it's it's hustle and bustle and um, like I didn't get the sense that it was like incredibly well developed I guess mm. um, but yeah I mean the author didn't net didn't net like really didn't go into it um, yeah and then I felt like it might have been somewhere like China it felt like the, some of the the terminology used in the book I think at one point he would. Um, Clara describes the mother's uh, outfit as high ranking, mm. and I'm like, that sounds it sounds like a communist state, <laughs> right, right, <laughs> kind of thing. So maybe it's China. I don't, I don't know. We never really kind of work it out. I think it might even be America, but um, it could, it could be. There are one or two yeah. references to America later on in the book, and I know that one of the characters in the book is English. Um, but yeah, that's true yeah <laughs> so there's a lot you don't know in this book as you go through it um, no it's definitely a book yeah you're right it's a book that kind of like gives you little clues and bits here and there to kind of like help formulate your th your um formulate a a timeline and also yeah. like some other goings on that the author isn't directly um getting to but you know that they're happening or like that they did happen um so that could be past events even current events um and it's i think you had mentioned that it you know that that kind of makes sense because it the narrative perspective is through clara um mm. and so she's not privy to uh, all of the information and and all the goings on yeah so i before we go a little bit any further really what I wanted to say as well was that I read Never Let Me Go and Oh you did also the um Remains of the Day as well. Oh wait, really? I listened to them actually. Oh. Both of them before I read this. Um in preparation. Did you really? Before I got too far through this in preparation, yeah. Oh, I didn't know that um, you did that. I did a bit of I did a bit of kind of I, I mean, I, I've said to you before recently, I've been finding it really difficult to kind of find um, something that's really floating my boat at the uh -huh. moment that I really want to listen to. And, uh, you know, I needed, obviously I was going to read Clara and the Sun, but I also needed to have something on my audio mm -hmm. book list to read, to, to listen to. And so I got, uh, initially I got Never Let Me Go. So I read that or listened to that at the same time, pretty much as I was reading this or starting mm -hmm. to read this. And the writing style is very similar. And actually, it's something that um, Ishiguro has said, is that he basically writes the same book over and over. Um, really? Completely different story, but similar 
themes and writing style and everything else. Mm -hmm. And what I was going to say about it was that he's really good at writing from a perspective of limited information. So the characters that he writes and certainly not so much Remains of the Day, but certainly Never Let Me Go is similar to this. And he's writing from the perspective of a child or somebody that is naive. So he's good at writing that naivety thing. Mm. But what I do question slightly is, was it too naive? Was it, does he not give enough credit to the kids or the androids for um, emotional intelligence? And I, yeah, I'm slightly, I don't feel completely comfortable with the characterizations of those people. But the writing, it's the 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 naivety itself is correct, and mm -hmm. it's that first person narrative where he's talking, uh, whoever it is that's narrating it, is uh, the naive person, and that's how you get the information. That's how the story builds up. I'm not sure I enjoyed that part of it. Mm, okay. <laughs> I don't know if I like to have more information. Hmm. I'm not sure, and I that's think that's interesting. Yeah. Well, I okay. So I didn't know that you had uh, done some like some homework. You really did. did some homework here I did for some this. Homework. Yeah. <laughs> um, would you? I guess before we move on, I'm just kind of curious. Would you? Yeah. Would you recommend Never Let Me Go or The Remains of the Day to anyone that has read Clara and the Sun? If this is their first Ishiguro. Book. Yeah, the remains of the day I think was quite short, so that's quite a good one. Okay. Um, because it's and it's an interesting one because the again the characters are really <laughs> the characters in that they're all grown ups in that one they're all adults in that one but um the characters are all very repressed. Mm. Um, they don't talk about their feelings. They don't feel their feelings. Uh. The, the storyteller is always written from the first person. The storyteller is always quite uh, sanguine or um, pragmatic. Uh, and yeah, I don't get huge amount of emotion out of any of them. And so <clears throat> while it makes sense for Clara to not be a hugely emotional person, although right. she does have emotions... Um, and to not maybe not be able to articulate those emotions correctly or whatever, it doesn't always make sense for all of his characters to be quite like that. Quite like that. That's interesting. Or to be a bit strange. Some of them are quite strange, but all the story concepts are fairly strange. So that's really interesting because um, now you have me thinking about um, I like tonally and thematically there were moments in this book where I had the impression that um, characters were um, upset or um, that it was like, it was kind of dark, darker yeah. in tone for sure. Um, up, up and down, there were moments of, of that. Um, not so much happiness. There was like fear. Yeah. There was, uh, sadness there was even some anger um, some frustration that I felt like some of the characters were were feeling and um, it's interesting I guess because I didn't I don't have the experience of the other two books it's interesting that you picked up on the fact that he has written a lot of characters that way um, yeah to it's be all very flat yeah kind of flat in motion <laughs> yeah. in, in emotion I should say yeah mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and and it makes sense. It makes sense for Clara, because, right? For Clara, yeah. yeah. But is it just? <laughs> is it kind of a bit of a rip off? <laughs> Interesting. It's like, oh, I don't have to think too much about these characters' motivations because Clara wouldn't know what those motivations were. So yeah. she can just describe it really flatly as hmm. this is what happened. Josie was sad. Josie was right. Right. Yeah, well, um, that's, I mean, that's very interesting because um, I I felt like um, it made sense. It fits for this book. Um, yeah. However, I could easily see that being like a trope that you would get sick of if re it was repeatedly happening in, in the books that you were reading. Um, yeah. 
So and a lot of it, a lot of it is um, thematically. There's a lot of accepting the lot that you've got as well. It's like this is. Uh, there's not a lot of fight push back against the expected trajectory of your life in any of these characters. It's yeah. kind of like um your Yeah, and, and I'm now thinking of Never Let Me Go rather than this one, but um <laughs> so it's gonna gonna bleed into each other a little bit. But I think also in this one as well, it's there's a little bit in this one of um ambition and wanting to be uh wanting like the neighbor nick rick rick sorry yes rick. uh he wants he's being pressured to aim to go to university and that mm-hmm. kind of thing so there's a little bit of pushback there but i think a lot of it is kind of like you know how uh an animal doesn't really know any better so if it's born in a cage it's yep. just like okay this is my life great uh, and I think there's that sort of that mentality simile of what this kind of a lot of these characters, uh, you know, their lives are. So you so I, I want to connect two things that uh, you and I talked about so far and that I'll have to cut that out, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? I don't know. There's something going on outside. Um, oh. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so I want to connect two things that you and I had have talked about already. Um, and it just made me question something in my mind. Um, one was where this took place, and then the other is kind of like this tone that you've picked up in characters uh, that we have uh, in our stories. So... Do you feel like there could be a cultural uh, yes. aspect to this? Maybe from the author's perspective, um, maybe just from like where this where it's taking place, maybe where the stories are taking place, that um, the emotions are not as um, maybe intense or in our face, or maybe our characters aren't quite understanding them. I think the not so much for Kat. Uh, for Kazuo Shiguri, um, I reading a little bit about him. He's uh, he's been brought up in uh, in England, so okay. culturally, uh, he's from a fairly sort of liberal kind of society. But I think certainly the society in the book, and that sort of bleeds out a little bit as you go through, seems to be quite. Uh, I'm trying to think of the right word. Uh, what's the word for when something could go either way? <laughs> um, um, I'm a precipice of maybe something oh, yeah. terrible. Sure. Happening. Like there's already been some pretty bad stuff happening. There's been a lot of uh, maybe jobs being taken by artificial intelligences. Yep. Yep. That's obviously had an impact on society. It's not discussed in any great detail at all. It's just hints that you pick up yeah. through the book. Um, and in that sense, it feels a little bit like quite a constrained society, quite, um, yeah. There's, there's like, un- unaddressed tension. Yes, you know, absolutely. That's yeah, it. okay, yeah. I, I was picking up what you're putting down there. Yeah, I definitely felt that at different times in the book. Um, and... Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's not something that, I'll be honest, before talking to you about this, it's not something that I really picked up on or thought about. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'd say that you're you're right about that. It's, it's interesting that you have picked that out. And maybe it is because, you know, of the other two books that you read. Um, but I, I do now see that yeah. he, he lives in London, his biography says. Uh, yeah. So you, who knows, Claire? You might run into Mister Ishiguro. I might. You never know. <laughs> we might, might end up in the same restaurant someday. I don't know. Right. Um, <laughs> but he, the other two books are set in standard UK. Okay. Pretty much as things are now, or in the case of, um, uh, what's the other one? Not Never Let Me Go. The other one. <laughs> Uh, the remains. Remains of the day. The remains yeah. of the day. Yes. Sorry, 
so that one's based in uh kind of the 20th century uh big country house type situation okay so uh this is the only one which i've read so far that actually had like a a slightly different societal sort of makeup yeah uh, although actually no never let me go is is a bit weird but it still feels familiar mm. whereas this one flower in the sun the society the area nothing felt familiar to me yeah yeah i could see that i mean i felt so, this i felt the same in that way that's yeah. that's why i was in my mind i was placing this uh you know somewhere somewhere else in the world um because i didn't quite feel like it was matching up to uh some of the th some of the things i guess that are um, more prominent in the culture of the region that i live um so yeah that's it's interesting um so from the time that clara is purchased by uh the mo the mother as it's referred to in the book um and um Josie between the two of them they go home and Clara gets to live um her life uh with Josie um in their home and uh they kind of go through and discuss the dynamics of the household um there's uh the housekeeper um mm -hmm and uh there's the mother and uh we find out later that uh there is uh Josie's father lives um somewhere else outside of town it seemed like not very very close yeah um and um i i'm trying to decide what is spoiler worthy and what is not spoiler worthy <laughs> um because i feel like there's something that i really want to talk about that um kind of starts to become you become as clara and the reader you become more aware of josie's situation mm. no i think i think that was i think we can talk about that okay a little bit because that's that becomes apparent relatively early in the book where they're talking about the walk Yes, exactly. So I think we can talk about that. Okay, so as Claire had mentioned earlier, when in the department store, the um, her mother had asked Clara to walk like Josie. Um, you you got the, the sense that there's something about Josie's walk that's unique. Um, and uh, it turns out, and I don't, but, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, Claire, but I don't believe they really went into detail about what specific ailment or or ailments okay. she Josie does have but Josie is a a young girl that is sick um and yeah. she seems to be um kind of going up and down in terms of health and uh she has been getting some help uh, from doctors and that's kind of one thing that they talked about um in the book over uh, the course of the book they just drop like little bits of information because again you're reading this from clara's perspective yeah that's it i mean it's again you get no information in this book at all kind of make it make it up yourself imagine what's going on with her yourself but yeah you don't know quite what's going on with the walk other than it's careful i think is the description she's yes you know walks gingerly or uh her careful walk i think it's described at one point um so yeah you don't but yeah it comes apparent it becomes apparent that josie is sick um what what's really weird is that the mum mother asks her to walk like josie mm -hmm. and you don't really understand why she would do that like why would that be important mm -hmm. and why would that be a choice? And you sent your brain, my brain was going through kind of like, well, does she just want this artificial friend to be able to be similar to Josie in some way so that she's more, you know, feels more represented or mm -hmm. something? I don't mm -hmm. know. It well, was kind of just, just weird. 
that is that so i kind of got the same the same vibes like and when i think about you know i of course tried to relate it to things that i know in my life um so i work with a lot of students that have disabilities and uh i have seen similar behavior from some parents that i've worked with in that they don't want their their child to look or feel different and so i've actually seen that you know similar things happen where they they want something to um demonstrate to their child that they are not all that different okay yeah that would make sense so that's a pretty good reason why the mother might have wanted her to do that Right. However, uh, we know that that's not necessarily the case as we continue through the book. And it was, I don't remember exactly when it clicked because it was before, it was before basically when the big moment happens and Mm -hmm. is revealed. Um, But it might have been when... Uh, I think that they talk about like the photographer. Josie is yeah. going to see this photographer um, to get pictures taken, and I was just like, "What are we? What's happening here? Like, what are we doing? Um, this seems sketchy." And they, um, there are multiple characters in the book. The housekeeper, in particular, that um, kind of is constantly talking. Uh, negatively about this situation about this photographer and um, you're not really like Clara or us as the reader we're not really sure why we nobody has given us a specific reason Um, there's like this weird potential possibility that um, he's taking advantage of her um, or at least that's the the impression that I got at one point and um, they yeah. the author describes Josie a lot of times in this book as very vulnerable. Mm. Or does he actually? Does he? Is that? Uh, do you mean he actually explicitly says that Josie is vulnerable? Or that no, you get the no. Impression that the she impression is? that she is. Right. Okay. So I get the impression that she's physically quite vulnerable. That she's physically quite sick. But mentally, emotionally, I think she's probably one of the stronger characters in the book that's interesting that's that's not the impression that i got okay hmm i like this yeah um (laughs) because often we disagree right right uh (laughs) and maybe it's just uh so I, Claire read uh, the physical copy of the book. I listened to this book on audio um, oh, on my commute. I didn't know that. I did, yes. So I I wonder if there was, uh, there's a potential of the narrator um, and their inflections maybe giving me a different impression. I don't know. Mm. Um, I found Josie to be... Um, she communicated uh, anger and frustration at times, yeah. but uh, you had mentioned like naivety. Um, I think that that was that came up multiple times for me in Josie's character, um, and not and withholding. I found her to be withholding, especially with Clara. Yes. yes. Yeah, definitely, and. Um word just came into my brain and it's just disappeared oh i hate that when it happens uh never mind no, sorry it's okay. carry on i think oh i know what i was gonna say is that unapologetic yes okay that is a great way of putting it yeah she's kind of spoiled in yeah. a way mm-hmm. um it, it i felt like the relationship with her and her mother was kind of strange but again, it's told from the perspective of this AF, not mm-hmm. from a, a human emotional kind of view on it. But I felt that that relationship was kind of strange. And then it did sort of get a little bit more um, the appearance of more of a parent-child kind of love bond. It did, um, yeah. But I think the the scene where she's entertaining 
the other children. That was hard. Yeah, that me. was horrible. Yeah. yeah. Kind of felt um yeah, she I mean it's kind of typical actually of very, a very very a teenage person. Mhm. But uh yeah, she she basically so she starts off she's she's one person, she's Josie. She's seems very nice. She's got a very close friend in or boyfriend, I guess, in the boy that lives next door. Um they're very close, they're very in love and all of that sort of stuff. Um and uh, it becomes a thing this thing has to happen where she has to entertain a load of other children. All the other children are horrible, generally. Um, and Josie basically becomes a horrible person around them, which is really, you know, teenagers do this. It's very they typical. get into a pack and they become, you know, a similar kind of personality and they don't want to appear to be probably weaker than the others. Mm -hmm. um, they want to, you know, act like they're the ringleader does or yeah they want to be cool um, they don't want to yeah. stand out i guess or or oppose like they're afraid yeah. of of thinking differently but rick on the other hand refuses to adapt to that kind of peer pressure and kind of just remains his own person and basically walks away mm -hmm. uh, and then makes it pretty clear that he didn't like the way Josie changed into a different person when she was around these other kids mm -hmm. but uh you know we talk about this a lot you know with our kids all the time they they do become different people almost when they're oh yeah their yeah for sure and we think we know the real one but is that the real them the one that's around us or is the real one the one that's around their friends who knows but uh <laughs> i don't know so. it I mean that's a broader philosophical question, I suppose, <laughs> but uh, which <laughs> we probably won't be able to answer. We have time for that right now. <laughs> right. <laughs> I like to think that there are people that bring out different things in us, um, and so I like to think that yes, we're all like it's all encompassing, and we're all oh, God, uh, we're all that <laughs> that person, but. Um, yeah. Yeah, but there might be like there are particular people that that bring out um, different things, and I don't know that that's necessarily always a bad thing or or should be a bad thing. But yeah, it's a little bit about courage, isn't there? And it's mm -hmm. who who has the courage to be able to stand up and be your true self in the face of pressure from others to conform. Yes, so. Of course, I'm talking about it from like a uh, my own personal experiences as it relates to the book. Though you are right on, like it definitely takes a lot in that situation to be able to, um, you know, say like, no, why would I treat, why would I treat Clara that way, or why would I talk to her like that? Um, yeah. And there was this clear like societal class. Um, impression that the author was um hinting at um with like oh i, I, I want to say it was like the b3s or something or the yeah. the, the ver like the version threes they were talking about they were comparing clara to um the newer model basically and um you know talking about well mine can do this can clara do that she's an older model type of a thing and um yeah that that scene was kind of difficult to mm. to get through because i was like i was i was emotionally charged in the in that moment i was like you wanted so badly for somebody to stick up for clara because she was not a like she wasn't going to stick up for herself because she was an NAF, I guess. And yeah. that's not how she was programmed. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, no, I think you're right. I didn't, I probably didn't feel as emotional about it as you did, but I think that's generally because at that point in the book, I was kind of bored. Okay. <laughs> um, that's fair though. Which is, you know, horrible kind of, I hate being negative about books. Because uh, eventually I did actually enjoy it, but it it picks up first drastically. Four parts of the book, maybe the first three parts of the book, were really 
kind of dragging on and I wasn't sure where it was going and the little drip, drip, drip of information mm -hmm. that was coming through and what they were talking about and they were talking about how lifted kids and non-lifted kids and what the hell that meant and you you don't learn anything as mm -hmm. you're going through the book you just get more and more questions and that that I think was frustrating me a little bit yeah no I I I completely agree um I felt like the book had some pacing issues um it was almost as if um so it's really funny, Claire, because uh, I think that I enjoyed the first three parts more than right. I did the last f part. Because um, it was like four yeah. or five parts, maybe. Um, six? Six. I think, I, I think six was... Last, yeah. The last one's really short. Yeah. yeah. So, like, it felt like the author found himself kind of getting to a point and then realized oh i need to wrap this up <laughs> like yeah <laughs> and like exactly whoa like there's some things that happened that kind of took me out by surprise um and uh should we talk about the scene with the mother um without josie before we go into spoilers or um do we they go for the waterfall yes or yeah okay do we yeah, want, or we do we want do. okay I'm yeah I'm just thinking no it's not a spoiler as such and I'm, I still didn't really understand what was going on at that point oh you didn't but oh no, okay I not I, really yeah is that where you'd already got it at that point yes right okay. I, I had picked up on what was I think going I was on just kind of annoyed with the book to that point at that point so I, I could see why yeah I wasn't really maybe thinking it through as much as perhaps I would have done ordinarily. Sure. Um, I was, I think at that point I was very much in the whole mindset of I've got to get through this book. Get through this. I have to read it for book nook. <laughs> <laughs> Rather than I'm really enjoying reading this book. This is great. Right. <laughs> um, okay. So I'll do my best to kind of describe the, the, the situation and then we'll kind of dissect it, I guess. Um, so we have uh, the housekeeper, um, the mother and Josie and Clara all get into the car. Um, and the mother kind of insists like that Josie is not feeling well and that she's basically faking being okay. Um, and that she needs to stay home and her and her mother kind of get into a bit of a, an argument. And, uh, what ends up happening is that, uh, Josie says, well, Clara really wants to go. And uh, that was probably just an excuse um, more than anything, because I don't think Clara would have been opposed to going back inside, you know, like she would have done whatever they wanted her to do. Um, and so what ended up happening was um, Clara and the mother ended up going to visit this waterfall instead of the whole group going together, the housekeeper and uh, Josie stayed behind because... That was actually one of the only bits where I felt it was kind of accurate from a mother's point of view because she mm. called her bluff. She basically. did. Yeah, she totally said, did. Fine, all right, I'm going to go. I'm going to take Clara. And that's exactly the kind of thing that I would have done. So yeah, <laughs> that was the bit where I felt, okay, this is a more natural mother-daughter kind of relationship that's going on right now. But yeah, anyway, it was, a, it was a definitely an interesting um, aspect of parenting that I feel like doesn't always get shown in media or you know in books um written about in in this kind of context but I've I mean I think that my parents have even done something to that effect before you know um not the same situation but something like it um yeah. so it's just kind of like it's a lesson that I think children learn <laughs> um yeah. you know over time but um Anyway, so they visit this waterfall, and uh, when they get there, um, it be it it started to get a little creepy. 
um, because Clara and the mother are kind of having conversations. Um, you're getting more bits of information about the father, which is really the first time that I feel like we've gotten anything about the father um, and his relationship with Josie and with the mother. Um, and I think that they even hint at like the father's disdain for the photographer um, and Josie going to the photographer. And you just kind of get this sense um, via like what is being spoken, but also then of course um, the mother ends up asking Clara to be Josie or like be act like her sound like her in pitch and in volume and do it as Josie would do it um and so those those things started to happen in this scene and it really started to it literally it made me feel uncomfortable to a certain extent oh massively uncomfortable yeah, yeah. I found that really cringy like this is weird. I don't like it. Stop it. Yeah. Um, which then really made my mind spiral and think, oh, there's clearly... Mo the mom does not believe that Josie's going to make it. Or that she purchased the AF not just to be Josie's AF, but actually to potentially replace Josie. Yeah, I didn't I didn't get to the the replacement thing. I should have done cuz you know, but I didn't didn't get to that. I don't know what I got to. I definitely got to okay, this is this is you know, getting towards Josie's possibly going to die. Mhm. Mm um, but there was a lot of discussion about how her illness was different. So she'd had a, an older sister that had died as well. Correct. And it was a lot of discussion about how what she had was different to what Sal had, her mm -hmm. sister. So I thought, well, maybe she's not going to die then. But, yeah. I don't know. I don't think I my brain really thought it through as well as it could have done at that point. Yeah. But you're right. That was, you know, quite a lot of clues going on. There, there was. There was. And um, it was just, like, super creepy. And, uh, again, I felt like it was... Uh, I don't know, manipulative in a way. I don't know. I did not. I just got very, very bad, uncomfortable vibes with, um, with it. Like there was coercion, um, potentially involved. Like I don't know. It was, it was super weird. Um, and it was a part of the book that I didn't. I didn't like how it made me feel, but I, from like a, a, I guess from like a respect the the writing type of a way, I was like, wow, that was a that was a really powerful scene. Yeah. Um, and storytelling, like from a storytelling perspective, I was like, whoa, <laughs> this yeah. this book is going somewhere very well that's weird. it it just took so long to get there i know <laughs> it was i i i had that feeling all the way through there's gonna be but i think this again is a theme from his other books you really don't get to the crux of it until right at the end and it's a bit like a whodunit mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. if i wanted to read a whodunit i would read agatha christie but <laughs> you weren't expecting that from this yeah i wasn't and it was just slightly frustrating that it was that you know reading mm -hmm. uh, a good two thirds of the book before we got really anything happening. <laughs> no, yeah, you're you're totally right because it's yeah. pretty much after this point that s things get very complicated and very at a very p fast paced. Uh, I yeah. would say. Um, so. Uh, they return home and uh, they kind of continue to like basically 
live their everyday lives, like things kind of progress um, in terms of, uh, you know, what happens from a story beat timeline perspective, like time passes basically. Um, and I think that's probably where we would, will want to. Uh, oh, can we talk about yeah. the sun? Though? Okay. Yeah. Cause I think this can be talked about without spoilers. Without spoilers. Yeah. So, and this struck me as quite interesting. So, it's Clara in, it's is in the powered. Title. <laughs> it is. So, <laughs> Clara is um, powered by solar power. Uh, and she describes it, and I believe the other AFs probably describe it in a similar manner as getting the sun's nourishment. Mm -hmm. You know, that's obviously how it's been described to her. You know, that she has to get nourished by the sun, and that gives her energy and allows her to get on with whatever it is that she's doing. There's a little bit of talk early on about how if she doesn't get any sun, eventually she would power down, um, you know, that kind of thing. But what I found really interesting about it was that she anthropomorphizes the sun. Yes. And it reminded me so much of something like early man, where they looked at the sun and went, oh, look, there's God. Yes. So... Isn't and that it's interesting? really interesting, like, the the AFs have almost their only, um, their, they, <laughs> they have a deity, they found, so to speak. They've almost created their own religion, haven't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah. With this deity in the sky that gives nourishment, and, you know, and she sees this uh, homeless man and his dog, and she thinks they're dead, and then, you know, a couple of days later, the sun comes out, and they're not dead. So she puts two and two together and comes up with 43 mm -hmm. and decides <laughs> that it's the son that has um, that has saved his life. This beggar man and his dog they saved his life. And it was the, the Cootings machine that's pumping out all the pollution that's like Lucifer in this. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, trying to block out the sun's nourishment and the sun has come out must keep the sun happy, mustn't make him angry, all of that kind of stuff. And it's so weird that this alternative, uh, this artificial intelligence android robot has been given a consciousness and created religion. Mm -hmm. And that made me like, that made me kind of just sit up and, and find an interesting bit in that. Mm. I don't know what you felt about that. No, that's that's really interesting. I don't think that I had like the same like captivation by it, but um pretty much from the time that she spent in the department store, it was apparent to me that um the way that she spoke about it and what she felt like the what happened um when the sun was out and what happened to her, what happened to her other AF friends, what happened to other humans that she would observe in this in this window store, um, or the store window. <laughs> um, yeah, it it definitely spoke to like, uh, oh, like not only does she appreciate the the healing attributes that seem to be coming from the sun, but maybe also the there's like a sense of like worship and like um marveling at at something that she didn't quite understand but she definitely saw it as being of higher importance and um she yeah i mean it wasn't necessarily like an undue fascination like it made sense in the context that she was speaking about it um and how what it meant to her but then uh the other bit which i think would be a spoiler if i talk too in depth about it but then something happens that reinforces her belief that mm -hmm. the sun is responsible for bestowing this amazing gift of whatever and that it's that a whole you know causation doesn't equal you know, correlation doesn't equal causation, but because this this thing has happened, and it's probably coincidence, mm -hmm. but it's reinforced that belief, and so she just carries on then believing that you know she's never dissuaded from that belief that the sun is a god and can bestow these amazing powers. Yeah, I felt like that was an interesting concept in the book. Yeah, it it really was. No, that's a great point to bring up, Claire. I'm really glad that we talked about that because. 
Um, I, f and maybe this is where my own biases and um, my own views kind of like, I was a little bit perturbed that um, other characters in the book never challenged her on it. Uh -huh. um, they just kind of like went along with it and was just like, yeah, okay, you, you got to do this. You got to do that. Um, I know. That was weird to me as well. But it yeah. was almost, it was almost like people were giving her this undue reverence because of her mm. intelligence as far as ability to to compute stuff so they're almost like okay well you're an amazing supercomputer therefore if you've worked this out then it must be real mm. therefore we're going to go along with you so like you're you're seeing like the af or clara yeah. in this person you know instance clara is seeing something that i'm not is essentially yeah. kind of like what you're describing yeah absolutely yeah I think okay. that's I think that's what the other characters are seeing in that when she's mm. saying it's really I can't tell you why but I need to go and do this thing. The other characters going well she's cleverer than I am therefore she must be, I, she must be correct therefore I need to support whatever it is that she's going to be doing. That's interesting um, because I you know I think that there are people that. Um, probably value and respect science in the same degree right in in our you know in our world um the only character that maybe ever gave clara like consistent grief was the housekeeper <laughs> yeah um yeah absolutely and she was, was very suspicious yeah like very suspicious <laughs> get -go. would kind of talk down to her very condescending and um challenged her a bit yeah in comparison to the others yeah absolutely yeah i think that the <laughs> it was interesting people were all, almost everyone was fascinated by her but that wasn't that didn't necessarily mean that they all approved of her mm -hmm. so i think the mother from like the next door neighbor's mum she was kind of suspicious but fascinated yeah um but again you know everyone wanted to ask her questions and find out more about her uh the dad was obviously pretty kind of standoffish to start with but yeah he was probably the only character that i really just was like okay whatever like he he yeah i didn't feel like he added a whole lot to like my understanding of the situation um didn't know maybe just like i don't know but he was there to give us uh, a bit more information about the society that they were living in true at the time at this yeah during the book true so the fact that he lived apart from uh clara and uh josie him and the mother were divorced but he was living in some kind of isolated community that's what it sounded like yeah yeah so uh yeah and he'd lost his job i think that was kind of key mm -hmm. yeah well they they talked about the place where dad used to work <laughs> you yeah. know and and yeah yeah okay so. but yeah i don't think we can get much further without spoilers no probably not we? no <laughs> so if at this point you are convinced that you're like all right i have heard enough about this book that i kind of want to read it and see what my perspective would be then now would be the time that you will want to uh st either stop listening or stop tuning in on the live stream and um maybe pick this ending back up um in the audio version i will put a um, just a timestamp of when you can jump back into the conversation because we are at the very end of this podcast going to um, choose the books that we're going to read uh, next. So you might want to hear those. Okay. So from this point on, we will be talking about spoilers. And go. We will, we will, we will. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Right. <laughs> okay. What do we want to talk about 
now we can talk about anything within now the book. Now we can talk about anything. Now we can we can talk about anything. What what is there anything in particular that you want to talk about, or do you want to give a pricey of? Um, I I want to talk a little bit about where the book lost me was the when they visited the city as a large yeah. group. Um, you as a reader and as Clara, you got this. Um, kind of ominous warning from the uh, housekeeper that uh, something was going to go down in the city today. Um, when you're, when you're traveling there, you need to take care of her. You need to watch over her, over Josie, that is. Um, and you need to like, basically the housekeeper made her promise to like, make sure nothing bad happens. And so, yeah, that was like, okay, what well, like, all right. And it had to do specifically with the photographer. Um, yeah. And um, I actually don't necessarily want to talk about that scene in particular, because again, it was kind of like something that I saw coming. Um, yeah. But the scene where the dad and Clara are together, it's just the two of them. And mm. uh, Clara devises this plot to take down the machine that is causing pollution and making Josie worse, um, or at least maintaining her sickness. Um, this is all perception of Clara, of course. Um, I, yeah, she's made yeah. this stuff up. She's yeah, this is a, yeah, this is a story that she's kind of like made up in her head. Um, no one has told her otherwise. Um, and they continue to not tell her and instead just entertain her ideas and these like crazy <laughs> plans. And hey. uh, that that's where the book kind of lost me a little bit. And that's like my biggest complaint about it. I was just like, y why would you just go along with this? I know. I, and I, I completely agree with you on that. I think it's kind of weird that the, no one would question it because like, rick doesn't question does... it either later i know um why would breaking this machine help josie it doesn't make any sense at all there's no connection between that machine and what's going on with josie josie lives away from the city she right. barely rarely visits the city except to come and see this photographer and whatnot why would this pollution giving machine have any effect on her whatsoever um i mean i suppose broadly you could see some connections yeah, but i yeah. yeah i think i would have been uh skeptical of that uh, as i th <laughs> i guess like from clara's perspective made sense we we already yeah. discussed that she feels as like we kind of related it to like the sun good pure um the pollution evil bad you yeah. know like there's um those Black smoke bad exactly so like from clara's perspective i get it from the humans around her that uh like she basically devises a plan to try to save josie um she uh and chronologically, did the scene where Clara overhears the photographer and mom talking happen before the the plan or after? I can't remember. I think it's after. I think it's after. It's yeah, after. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, the dad. So Clara approaches the dad and is like, "Hey, can you help me with this? I want to help Josie, um, and I think by sabotaging this machine." Uh, and destroying it, I think that she'll get better. The dad's like, I know how to, I know how to take it apart or something like that. So yes, I'll help you. And like, there's really no pushback whatsoever. And I'm just like, I guess we're just going to destroy public property. <laughs> you was, know, like, I know. It was a bit far-fetched. I think it was a stretch. There's only two things that maybe, for me would uh explain that or kind of explain his motivation a little bit in that one he was 
kind of this character who had been in mainstream society and now lives on the fringes of society mm. and maybe is a little bit uh rebellious conspiracy theorist <laughs> yes yes yeah survivalist um maybe prepper you know i didn't think he's about one that. of these one of these guys that lives on a hill and thinks the government are coming for their guns. Yeah. Damn you know, the that man. kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Right? So for him, I think that motivation just to break something. Okay. That might be, you know, uh, holding up the structure of this society that he hates so much. A cog. A cog in the system. Yeah. yeah. So maybe that is enough motivation for him. And then obviously the other thing, which I said before, is that you know, to, to the people in this book, they've been led to believe that the artificial intelligence that resides within Clara, or that is Clara, would be far cleverer than they are. So who are they to question if she's worked something out that could save Josie? Why would they question that? Yeah. Because she's a supercomputer and she probably knows the answer to the world and everything. You know? But they never... they the, I, I agree. I think both of those theories I can get behind. I just wish that but if it was that were the uh, if that were the case, I just wish that the author would have like given us even a one like one sentence dialogue of like Clara, you know more than me about this sort of a thing, or you know like anything related yeah. to like the fact that they may respect her higher judgment when it comes to this. But, but this is the whole thing, isn't it? That's what we were talking about right at the beginning of this podcast. We we're talking about uh, Ishiguro and and how he writes, and he does not give you that information no. ever. No, no, you you have to work it out as you go along. You have to work it out for yourself, and it's, and even when you finished it, you you can be sat there thinking, "Have I interpreted that correctly?" Mm -hmm. And yeah, so I think that <laughs> that's part of it. I mean, I think, and your frustration with not getting the information fast enough um, is warranted. My frustration comes with never delivering on it, like in yeah. in this sense, like. I'm good with it if you eventually give it to me because if I haven't figured it out by now, I'm okay with like you, you know, someone telling me basically like solving the puzzle for me. But to yeah. just not give me anything and for me to just be like, okay, they're going to never question this and um, they're going to destroy something that could potentially get them into legal trouble and then not help Josie at all. <laughs> it was just odd yeah. to me yeah but it was really odd and i found that all the way through when uh even with rick who's a really clever kid yeah he's skeptical and yes i mean emotionally just... flat but you still got that whole being skeptical thing mm -hmm. uh and questioning and everything else but even he was like oh you need to get to mcbain's barn okay let's go right you i know need to tell me why yeah i <laughs> know <laughs> i know i know claire that's exactly what i was thinking because this <laughs> the entire book um rick was kind of like in the eyes of clara i don't think that she completely understood him and the relationship that that she uh, that he had with Josie other than that they were really good friends um, that Josie trusts him. Um, but he's always kind of like this mysterious character that I actually viewed as older than, than Josie. I don't know if you did. I did actually. I felt Josie was a lot younger than not a lot, but <laughs> in terms of that age group. Yeah. Um, I think she was 15, but she felt a little bit younger than that to me. I was picturing um, like 12 or 13 in 13, my head. 13, I was, yeah, in my head, yeah, I thought 13. But I think she was 15. I think he was the same age. Okay. But yes, he certainly felt older. Yeah. Uh, than her, but... Uh, and uh, Clara yeah. had a scene, and so just to kind of loop this back in Clara had a scene with Rick and Rick's mom that really I felt like it was a good scene like a it kind of helped um the reader understand uh the relationship and dynamic that was going on in the house next door um yeah. which kind of helped explain some things that we had been um hint that had been hinted at before related to um Rick's mom's kind of 
cognitive and mental health. Um, and that Rick was very much so, it seemed like, caregiving um, to his mom. It, it helped understand Rick a little bit more, I felt like. Yeah, I felt he's equal parts worried and mm -hmm. caregiving and also embarrassed by <laughs> yeah there was like an element of shame there yeah yeah um but uh but yes she was quite open she's she was you know, obviously didn't have much of a filter no in comparison to how the author wrote the other characters i was like finally <laughs> someone yeah. that's just going to, <laughs> to kind of give it to us you know as it is exactly um, yeah and so yeah, so that brings us to this question that that Clara has for Rick, which is basically like, I uh, I have to do this thing. I can't tell you about it. Don't know why Clara never gives a, a reason other than yeah. I guess maybe it comes down to like again maybe it's like beliefs and superstitions, but um, essentially, or maybe like you're not intelligent enough to understand i don't know um but I think it's superstition it I could be that's all it, is. it could yeah. be and really so she asks rick will you help me get to this barn um and i don't know that they ever t let us as readers into like why the barn is important but you know that it's connected to the sun somehow right I know she believes that the sun goes to sleep there. That's what it is because it yeah. goes down right by, like basically right through yeah. the barn. Um, yeah. So they, again, Rick is like, sure, I'll help you. And no, you don't have to tell me um, anything, which is fine, <laughs> um, I guess. Yeah. But uh, basically, gives clara a piggyback ride it sounded like all the way to like this location um yeah and again it was just like another convenient um avenue for the author to take of like i don't have to explain <laughs> any of this to you <laughs> uh, you're yeah. just going to accept it and move on yeah just just work it out just it's fine it's work fine it out. yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know, uh, Claire, what did, uh, maybe you pick up from here, like, what, uh, what did you think about those scenes, or do you want to talk about a different scene? Um, no, I think, uh, I kind of, yeah, I think we've got to the the crux of that, that scene is that okay. everyone just kind of went along with Clara, and, but yeah, I think it's definitely superstition, I think it's definitely this whole kind of deity that she's created from the sun, uh, and that she believes that if she tells anybody, then that will anger the son, and then he won't actually help. Mm -hmm. uh, don't like the fact that uh, the son is gendered. Um, but there you go. That's just me. I guess I didn't um, pick up on that. I've only just thought of that. Okay. Just that second, I'm like, that's weird. I don't know why she would assume that the son was male. Oh, okay. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think I want to just get to the whole kind of point of the book, which is okay. the fact that that they've been working towards replacing if something were to happen to Josie, if she doesn't make it through this illness, that Clara would basically be downloaded into a facsimile of Josie. And then become Josie and carry on for her. Yes. Um, for her mum. So and basically, just be yes. a grief doll. Yes, for, Th that is exactly uh, right. Um, and Clara, while uh, you know, has agreed to that, and obviously she would try her best. She's actually really skeptical about whether she'd be able to do it or not. Um, but she's still convinced that she can get the sun to help JC and the sun will, will fix JC. Mm -hmm. um, and then that's where the, the kind of the two strands of the story kind of meet. Mm -hmm. um, because Clara would absolutely have done that. Would that have worked? Uh, 
And that, I think, is the theme for me of that book, is that if you replace... It's, it's almost impossible. It's that replacement, isn't it? What... Uh, I suppose this is... This might need editing because I'm waffling. Uh, so where it said, what does it mean to love? And this is the bit where I think this is what it explores. Because could you love something that is an exact replica of your child? Mm. Acted like your child, spoke like your child, looked like your child, but wasn't your child. Could you, could you forget that it's not your child and love that that intelligence as if they were still your child and i it doesn't compute to me how that would ever work um because it's uh you know that that i think is the main question that the book kind of throws up and then i think that's then the conversation around what makes us us mm. And can you ever, even if you could copy it almost exactly, is that is that us then? Are we just carrying on? I, I, I yeah, know. no, I I hear you, um, and I'm not sure that that's a question that I have an answer for. That's no. I th I think that. Do you feel like that question was answered for you in the book? No, absolutely yeah. not. Well, yeah. I th actually no, I think it probably was actually. I think the the answer is no. Mm -hmm. I mean, they never get to the point where they have to try it. True. Because Josie, <laughs> this is where that causation correlation thing comes in. Because Clara makes a deal with the son. Mm -hmm. The son then uh, Josie gets very very ill. They're not sure she's going to make it through. Uh, the the day after or some point after Clara's made this deal with the son, he then uh, shines on Josie and she wakes up and she's okay and she's got through this illness. Uh, but and that's when Clara obviously that's reinforced this thing with Clara that the son is a benevolent god and can fix people by shining at them. Mm -hmm. um, so. <laughs> uh, so we never get to find out if it if it would have happened or not. And I think when we get to the real ending of the book where Clara is basically in a junkyard because right. she served her purpose and then been thrown away like you would do a Hoover or a you know, vacuum cleaner or a fridge. Mm -hmm. Uh I think in a way that sort of answers the question. Because if you mm. were close to something, you wouldn't be able to just just toss sell it. it. Yeah. throw it away or whatever yeah so yeah, that sort mm. of answers the question but i think what makes us us it's almost atheistic uh the book in this kind of theology because i think the author doesn't believe that it would work no um so then do we have a soul? Can we recreate the essence of being human in an artificial intelligence? It's, uh, yeah, I think, uh, I, I don't think there's anything that can overwrite the chemical uh, reactions that go on in your brain when you have a child mm -hmm. or when you love somebody, when you love another person. I don't think you can generally have that same chemical reaction to loving an android i'm not sure okay so we should say that the photographer that we've been hinting at this entire podcast um is really the person that is ha is responsible for um uh attempting to like you like claire had mentioned like downloading um recreating um josie to be uh, Clara essentially like there would be no more Clara um it would be Josie uh, moving forward and so the photographer and like the photographs that were taken were to attempt to um replicate Josie in every single facet um from a physical perspective um and so um, this idea that Josie could be replaced, um, like Claire said, didn't never had to come to fruition. Um, yeah. And 
the person, the photographer, um, still believes that it can be done. Um, they even hint at, uh, I believe they hint at the possibility that they attempted this with Sal, um, Josie's sister. Yes. I'd forgotten about that. Yes. They, they had. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it, it did not a work good version. Right. <laughs> yeah. it, it didn't, it wasn't successful. Um, and so, um, but, uh, and the father was not on board with this, this, um, plan of replacing, okay. uh, Josie. So this was very much a, uh, the mother was kind of driven to, um, attempt to replicate this should anything happen to Josie, um, and Clara finds out uh, what the true purpose of all this is, and she does agree to help, um, you know, if it comes down to that. But she really is hoping that she can uh, make things better by destroying the pollution and making this deal with the sun. Um, I thought what was interesting yeah. is that they did um, they were successful in destroying the the cause of the pollution only to realize that there are multiple um yeah. machines and that but why didn't that occur to the dad because the dad would have looked at that machine and gone oh yeah that's like a road laying machine or something There'll there's be loads a of those. ton of those you can't, you again can't destroy them all again yeah something that will never <laughs> get answered for us um no. But Not unless we, you know, go and find whatever restaurant Shiguru likes, <laughs> whatever to cafe, hang out in and, yeah, yeah, go and go and accost him in I don't know, Nobu or something. Maybe so, they're hey, all, maybe he'll explain this. Maybe he'll do a book signing in London, maybe. and you can go ask. <laughs> maybe I'll go and ask. Yeah. Excuse me, this thing about your book I really didn't like. Can you explain <laughs> why you did this? <laughs> yeah, I'm just curious. What what made you choose to go in this direction? Um, so it's interesting, like that, uh, the question that the author kind of poses in the synopsis of the book is what does it mean to love? And instead I felt like the question should actually be what, what lengths would you go to, to maintain or to experience it? Because um, the mother does not want to let go, obviously. And so yeah. I feel like there's a sense of like she wants to continue this. And the, although there are major ethical implications uh, abound in this decision to potentially create a, a Josie 2.0, it it kind of speaks to not wanting to let love go. Um, and I felt like Clara uh, in this entire book, her purpose was to help uh, those around Josie process with, uh, I guess, what was happening to her, but yeah. also to be loved by Josie. And yes. that kind of that kind of brings us to, I suppose, after the point where Josie recovers um, and gets better and time passes, I believe. I'm not sure how many years. Yeah. But essentially it's described in the book as Clara being placed in the utility closet and living in the utility closet. Un until Josie leaves for college. Yeah, um, yeah it's. I think the impression I got me. is that it was. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it was. It was a little bit depressing. I think the impression I got was that it was a gradual uh, oh, growing did. apart. Okay. Of, so I think uh, that she initially went and spent some time in the utility cupboard to stay to be out of the way. Yes, be, you know, in the yeah. way of Josie and her friends and things that um, where people were coming to stay and stuff like that, and uh, and then I think gradually it kind of got more and more that she was in there more and more, 
and then eventually Josie goes to college and we don't really hear when it happened or what happened but then yeah obviously right at the end she's no longer with the family and she's mm -hmm. in a sort of junkyard of some description yeah um i thought it was very interesting um just in i don't know if the author meant to do this or if i'm just drawing too much from it but um the access to the sun and the utility closet was uh we would call them here in the states like a storm window or a recess uh window right yeah like it's basically like picture um maybe two feet by one foot uh like window that uh she would have access to the sun and yeah. that she could look out of in the utility closet and that was just i don't know it just that i i was sad i was just sad mm. for someone that um started off in a department store clamoring so excited to be in the showcase window to be able to get access to the sun and she uh, you know she got and to look out and learn things about what's going on around her and and she really liked watching the people go past and exactly you know, she talks about her memories of these two people meeting and hugging in the street and that kind of stuff and yeah she was it was really sad. It was a really sad ending. It yeah, was. For Clara. Yeah. yeah, for Clara it was. I think for the rest of the characters, it was probably what we would describe as like, a, you know, probably like a happy ending-ish yeah. um, in that all the characters um, kind of continued their lives and um, Rick ended up, did end up going off to uh, uni, right? Uh, no, he doesn't go to university. He does continue making his drones. Oh, that right. He doesn't That's right. Go to the birds. But they completely grow yes. apart. And yes. They're not together anymore. I yeah. They're... And that's yeah. quite realistic, I think. I think that's very, quite realistic. And, yeah. Very realistic, yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I don't I was I was fine with the ending. I was just like... Oh man, this it's a bummer. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah, it was it was a bit of a bummer and Clara herself doesn't really mind. No. That's I think that um, also just, adds like, to the sadness for me. Absolutely. <laughs> she's just like, okay. This yeah. is this is how I live now. Yeah. And it's, you know, just accepts it, but you know, I guess that's the benefit of being a robot. I Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> but um I was. We were talking earlier about quotes from the book, and yeah. we were talking also about the the theme of the book and love. And can you love something that's facsimile of your of your child? And this is the bit in the book, part of the bit in the book, where the dad and Clara are talking in the car, and it's not about the the machine, but it's about what's going on at the uh, photographer's place, and. He hates the photographer, he's Capaldi, Mr. Mm -hmm. Capaldi. Uh, and he says, I think I hate Mr. I think I hate Capaldi because deep down I suspect he may be right. But what he claims is true, that science has now proved beyond doubt there's nothing so unique about my daughter, nothing mm. that there our modern tools can't excavate, copy, transfer. Uh, that people have been living with one another all this time, centuries loving and hating each other, and all on a mistaken premise, a kind of superstition we kept uh, We kept going while we didn't know better. That's how Capaldi sees it, and there's a part of me that fears he's right. Chrissy, on the other hand, isn't like me. That's the mother. Uh, she may not know it yet, but she'll never let herself be persuaded. If the moment ever comes, never mind how well you play your part, Clara, never mind how much she wishes it to work, Chrissy just won't be able to accept it. And I think that's exactly how I would fit. I feel about that. Mm -hmm. I don't think that it doesn't matter how well, how good a copy it is, you would always know, and you would never be able to accept that that is now your child. It's a facsimile. It's not actually your child. And I think that relationship would never work. I agree. But yeah. Anyway, so that was the quote I, I wanted I, to talk about. In the I book. love that quote. Yeah, I'm glad that you chose that one. And yeah. 
I completely agree with you. Um, I it would take um, someone <clears throat> uh, stuck in grief um, and unwilling to accept the the truth. I suppose. Yeah. Um, for uh, for someone to like be able to believe and and continue to live um, <clears throat> without the without that affecting them. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, uh, I'm glad. I was. I'm glad that uh, we, it didn't end up going that route. Um, you know, for Josie's sake and for the family's sake, I was. I was happy, um, and yeah. even <clears throat> to some extent, you know, Clara. I mean, I didn't. I wanted her to have her individualism, right? I mean. Yes, they like semi asked for her consent, but like she's programmed to, you okay, know. How can somebody that has to that. say yes ever yeah, consent? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It yeah, it doesn't work that way. And that's where I felt like it was incredibly like exploitative and, um, yeah, major ethical red flags in, uh, with that. But very interesting story that I never expected to read so yeah no I, I agree with that yeah definitely was not the story i was expecting yeah um so with that uh i suppose we should welcome back our spoiler <laughs> our spoiler free uh <laughs> audience um yeah. if you are ready to move on i suppose we should rate uh clara yes, and the sun and then we should talk about our next books yeah uh so the rating have we got the rating system can you remember <clears throat> um like it's, what the actual it's tabbed in uh my discord so i need to locate it uh -huh. yeah we should look for that Oh, I found it. Okay. Could you link it? Uh, just like send it oh. to me. Uh, it is. Oh, there we go. It wasn't. It, it was giving me a privacy error. Oh, really? I didn't open it. Yeah. So I will paste that to you right now. Bear there with us. Go. We were not organized. Yeah. Oh, I can edit this part out. There you go. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh yeah. It does that? yeah, it yeah. says your connection is not private. Uh yeah, it's because it's an HTTPS link. Oh. So um yeah. I don't know why it's being like that. What I might do is just take the ratings and paste them into something else. That's a and great idea. Think about that next time. Ooh. There we go. Okay. Um... We got it. Yes, I do. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, so for editing purposes, three, two, one. Okay, so our rating system, how we're going to choose to rate this is uh, through a system that we found online that we have used in the past. Um, so you might be familiar with our rating system. It's a five-star system. Um, but let me read uh, the description for each star, and then that might help um, our audience kind of understand what we uh 
what we rated it as. So we have yeah. one star, which is a complete waste of time, uh, problematic in terms of writing styles, inaccuracies, or written without any strong base. Um, you disliked the book so much that you didn't really want to finish it. Um, two stars would be fine, but not happy with it. You found it to be more irritating than rewarding. Um, you thought it was problematic and uh, over complicated. But you read it um, just for the sake of reading, but got nothing out of it. Um, three stars is kind of where like recommendation would begin. Um, so three stars or higher, you would recommend this book. Um, two stars or lower, you would not. Um, three stars would be satisfactory, not too bad. Average, but satisfying read. Um, it was a little rewarding, but not too much. Um, wasn't a total waste of time. And then four stars, you loved it. Um, it was a really good book. There were like minor improvements, uh, but it was okay. You liked the writing style. Um, you uh, could read this again and would definitely recommend this book. And then five stars is impactful. So this kind of means that uh, you found the book to be pretty flawless and a fantastic read and that it made a major impact on maybe a point of view that you had about something and um, that you would strongly recommend this book and that you look forward to other works by this author. Um, so... Claire, <laughs> how <laughs> would you, would you like to be the first one to rate a sure. book on our podcast? Why not? Okay. I'm struggling to rate this book because um, I'm not entirely sure that it's as low as a three, mm -hmm. which is satisfactory, not too bad. Mm hmm but I also don't think it's as high as a four because I didn't love reading it. Um, it's a good book. It needs... I don't know what it needs, actually. I don't think I would presume to say it needs something. But um, what I will say is that it's it was slow for two-thirds of the book and then the last bit of the book was too rushed. Mm-hmm. So, I agree with uh, that. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of the book. So I think what I might do is I would recommend it to other people to read because I think it's an interesting read and I think it makes you think about some things. Uh, and I'd like to see other people's uh, kind of ideas of how they felt about the book. But I think a three and a half is probably where I'm at. Mm -hmm. Um. I yeah I'm I agree with just about everything that you said Claire um I also feel like this is a book that I would recommend to someone although I it's not like a blanket recommendation to anyone like I would probably need to know that person's uh style like reading habits maybe and like other books that they liked to be like oh i could see you really enjoying this book um things that i liked about it um un uh, i think unlike you i actually did enjoy the writing style because i liked kind of trying to figure it out in my head as i was reading um especially as someone that was only getting information from clara's point of view yeah. Um, so I kind of did enjoy that and I looked forward to, to, you know, when I would get in the car and be able to listen to it. So I think in that sense, like, I, I think that I actually, you know, really enjoyed it. So, um, or at least wanted to see like how it was going to end, um, mm. and what was coming next. That being said, there were definitely some things that I didn't like about it, um, and we have talked through that on this podcast, so I won't rehash everything. Um, I don't know that I could give it a four, though. Um, I'm kind of in the same boat as you, Claire, but for different reasons. And I think a three and a half is, is about right. Yeah. Okay. I like it. 
Um, okay. Yeah. So here's the deal, chat and uh, audience listeners. If you have read this book and you would like to uh, give it a similar rating, uh, using a similar rating scale, I should say, not a similar rating, you might think completely differently than us. Um, we would love to hear it. Um, you can tweet at us. You can hit us up in the Discord. Um, we are going to actually be keeping track of ratings. Um, that's something that we did before uh, before we started this podcast, and we really liked to look back at our ratings of books and see if we felt differently now. Um, you know, have has it changed or uh, is it still accurate? How it you know compares to other people. So just kind of something fun. Um, but, uh, hey, Claire, we did it. That's our first official podcast with a rating. Well Yay. done. Well done, everybody. Well done. Good job. Yeah. Yeah. No, that was good. I enjoyed that. Absolutely. So, I was going to say one more thing, yeah. actually. No, go for that. it. Um, when you said something about you did enjoy the writing style, you did enjoy it. I think I enjoyed it after I'd finished it. And I could then go back and think, well, now I understand why the bits I don't didn't like yes. were actually there. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. It made it more enjoyable retrospectively, but at the moment it was kind of like, okay, I'm unsatisfying. Kind of yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I I I'm one hundred percent with you there. Like I get that sentiment yeah. completely. Um well Clara and the Sun by Ish, uh, by Kuzio Ishiguro. That's I'm I'm glad that we got that we got a chance to read that book. Like yeah, I am I am glad that I read that book, which I can't say for all books that I've read. <laughs> so yeah, no, definitely, and I've enjoyed kind of reading his other works as well this month. So. It's been it's been interesting. I was gonna say, Claire, you did a deep dive into Ishiguro's work, so <laughs> I did. I'm not gonna do that every month. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna, yeah, yeah. We're not gonna commit to that every month. No, um, but and it wasn't like a plan that I made. It was just like, oh well, I'll just listen to this other book that he did, and then I finished that, yeah. and then he did another book to listen to, and I was like, maybe I should just listen to Remains of the Day. Um, oh, and glad. now I want to watch the movies as well, just to just to compare and contrast. Oh, I didn't even know that they made them into movies. They did, yeah. Is there plans yeah. for Clara and the Sun to be? Uh, I don't know. I don't know about that. Okay, that's it's interesting. Probably too new, isn't it? I can't remember. Anything. So yeah, this so this book was written in 2021, or at yeah. least published, I should say. And he has written a lot. He's written a lot of books. Okay. Um, and obviously won the Nobel Prize for Literature and that sort of thing. So he's obviously, you know. Yeah, so, he's an established uh, Remains writer. of the Day was um, filmed in 1993 and had Anthony Hopkins in. Oh, okay. Uh, and Emma Thompson. Oh, my word. And Christopher Reeve, weirdly. Wow. Uh, I believe that must have been pre-accident Christopher Reeve, I guess. Um and then Never Let Me Go, I think is more recent. Yeah, 2010, I think. Yeah, Never Let Me Go, 2010. Uh, and I don't know who else, who was in that one. Oh, Kerry Mulligan, Andrew Garfield, Kira Knightley. Oh, wow. That's a pretty so, big cast. It is, and I've not seen it, so... Yeah. Hmm. Might have to check those out. Now I've read the book. I mean, I I've seen the film on like Apple Movies because okay. I I buy quite a lot of films through my sure. Apple TV, and I've seen it in in there. And uh, I kind of didn't really fancy it, but now I've read the book, I want to watch it more. Okay, that's very cool. I those are things that I didn't know. Um, should we talk about uh the books that we're going to choose to read next? Yes, I will let you talk about them because okay. they are this month your choices. They are. They are. Because I couldn't think of anything. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so Claire and I were like, when we decided, okay, we're going to read a nonfiction book and a fiction book um, every month, we hadn't really 
discussed like, okay, now what do we read? So we both wanted to come up with like an idea of one from each category to propose. And then between the two of us, we would decide which one we want to read next. Um, so I put mine in uh, our little personal Discord chat and you were like, you know what? Those two sound interesting enough. I'm good with that. So yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, so I'm sure in a future month we'll probably have two from Claire as well. Um, so I think in terms of like the next book, we'll probably do the nonfiction right first. Yeah, yeah, okay. I think so. Um, you can read these uh at the same time, but uh, basically for the next podcast it will be a nonfiction book and the book that we'll be reading is called educated by tara westover um just to give a brief little synopsis tara westover was born was 17 the first time she set foot in a classroom she was born to survivalists in the mountains of idaho where she prepared for the end of the world by stockpiling home canned peaches and sleeping with her head for the hills bag um and so this is kind of it talks about her i i suppose like her coming out of a very individualized um isolated i should say um setting and into the classroom where she is she kind of develops her education so i'm like really interested to read this book um i it was uh it's won some awards and i don't know much about um the the author but i do know that she is an american who ne uh, lives in the uk so yeah um so yeah claire what do you think about the about this book i am really looking forward to reading it okay um, good it feels it's just um it's that alternative perspective isn't it it's yeah. so completely against the mainstream and and how that works like and and the greatness of humans adaptability to changing circumstances and resiliency I think it's gonna be good. i'm looking for it yeah absolutely i think i'm gonna um i think what's what's intriguing me about it is where she really does not know anything when she first goes into a classroom yes she only knows what she's been taught by her community or whatever her family mm -hmm. um she doesn't know things about civil rights and the holocaust and stuff like that and yeah it's like that's like major world events yeah. yeah that's gonna be interesting to read that it is gonna be interesting i'm excited for that um and then our uh our fiction book so basically a month from now um we will be uh doing a podcast uh on the book the kaiju preservation society by john scalzi um and uh i i just think that this book sounds really interesting um and the little brief synopsis here is when COVID-19 sweeps through New York City, Jamie Gray is stuck as a dead-end driver for food delivery apps. That is until Jamie makes a delivery to an old acquaintance, Tom, who works at what he calls an animal rights organization. Um, Tom, Tom's team needs a last minute grunt to handle things on their next field visit, um, and Jamie joins their team. Um, what Tom doesn't tell Jamie is that the animals his team cares for are not here on Earth. Not our Earth, at least. Um, it's in an alternate dimension. Massive dinosaur-like creatures named Kaiju roam a warm and human-free world. Uh, they're, they're the universe's largest and most dangerous panda, and they're in trouble. So I'm really interested to see 
what that's like. It kind of, you know, it sounds like yeah. Kai, when I think Kaiju, I think Godzilla. So, <laughs> right. Um, okay. You know, so it's going to be really interesting. I think. I hope. Yeah. It, it has. Yeah. Very I'm good looking ratings. forward to that one. It feels a little bit like, I don't know if you've read it. Um, and is it Ernest Klein? I'm trying to think who wrote it. Outland. Um, mm -hmm. I know the is, author, but I don't think I've read that book. I can't remember who wrote it. It might not have been Ernest Klein. It's one of those. One of those. Um, Outland book, 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 book. <laughs> oh, dear. Hang on. Who wrote it? It's important to me that I find out right now. Dennis Taylor, Dennis C. Taylor. That was oh. it. So, um, yeah, he's the one that wrote the the Bobby verse, isn't he? Uh, anyway, uh, that's a similar thing where there's like an alternative dimension type thing going on. Okay. Um, and also a little bit of um, uh, the uh, Pullman's his dark materials oh really so i'm looking forward to reading that it sounds interesting okay yeah yeah um, i think it's gonna be great um so um i uh cannot promise a podcast next week um but uh basically two weeks from now uh you can expect uh episode two where we discuss hey. educated um and uh, as always, I appreciate you, Claire, for co-hosting this with me and uh, the audience for listening and joining us. I, I appreciate you more. <laughs> you <laughs> always say that. And I always say no. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah. Well, thanks, everybody, for listening and hanging out. Um, we will uh, go ahead and end now and we'll see you soon. Happy reading. Bye. And scene. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Yay. Awesome. I was going to say, did we just create a little sign off thing where we're like, I appreciate you, Claire. And I'm like, no, I appreciate you more. We I'm may have gonna, like, yeah. that may just have to be like our thing now. <laughs> and then are we just going to end the stream by just going, you hang up. No, you hang yeah, up. Yeah, exactly. You hang up. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that went really well. It, uh, I, th yeah, me too. I okay. Did. One thing that we hadn't talked about, Claire, that I'm thinking mm. about is, uh, length. Like, do, yeah. do we want to, I mean, do we want we to, we are way too long at this point. Yeah. Do we want to, like, I guess, I don't know. Part of me is like, I don't want to limit the conversation for us to always be thinking about it. Um, maybe we just maybe the unedited like live streams are as long as we want them to be and then the the audio yeah. version i just kind of cut up based on flow i guess yeah i think we can do that definitely i think yeah the stream absolutely fine i think we can just chat away and do whatever it just it kind of adds a little bit of work for you i guess to i mean try and get that down cut that down to like an hour and 20 or something like i was that. just gonna say like what if we on like the back end we just know that we'll shoot for like no longer than 90 minutes for a podcast and then if it's if it happens to be shorter it is if it you know up until that point i guess you know i don't know i can list so personally i can listen to long podcasts but i know that like, people are not as into that so <clears throat> i know an hour i listened to a podcast once that was i think there were about six episodes and every episode was about three hours long yeah and it was discussing um pride and prejudice the original tv series oh my word that's hilarious <laughs> and i loved every second of it it that's... was so good <laughs> that's fantastic so i guess so that just made me think of something last weekend you said that you just found out about bridgerton 2 yes. or is bridgerton season 2 did you end up yes. watching that this week <laughs> I watched all of it in about two days. Yeah, yeah nice. I love nice. it. It's so bad, but I love it. I've heard good things. And it's not bad. It's great. It's yeah. really, really good. Yeah, I've heard but, good things. Um, it's not 
it's not in any way intellectual, really. Right. But it's got some great themes, and it's you know it's a bit of fun. And I actually really love the colorblind casting that's part of it. That's yeah. Fantastic. Um, yeah. No, it's really I loved it. Uh, I I should probably check it out because it's it's. I don't know that it's been recommended directly to me, but people are talking about it and have all said like, you know, really good things. So I should check it out. So the second series has less nudity and, you know, debauchery in it than the first oh, okay. season. Is it so more it's... like plot driven in the second? Yeah. Okay. I mean, the first one was, was pretty plot driven as well. It was just, there was also quite a lot of sex. <laughs> it was just and then, sprinkled um... in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This, this time around, there's not as much. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I'm not opposed. I've watched, you know, I've watched Game of Thrones and it's yeah. it's all over the place in there too, so. Absolutely. But no, it's I really enjoyed it. Um yeah, I was kind of sad when it when I got through it all. Really? I should have rationed it a bit more. Is it and, uh yeah. how long are the seasons? Like 10? Oh, it's only like 10, 10 yeah. episodes, I think. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And they're like an hour each. But yeah, it, 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 I I I went through it way too quickly. <laughs> yeah. I'm kind of feeling a bit, I don't know, I'm very, very kind of narrow in what I'll watch and read and listen to at the moment. Um, and so I'm sort of running yeah. out of things I really fancy watching. So <clears throat> I I have been in a rut when it comes to like content that I'm watching. I've actually been watching mostly a lot of GTA RP. Oh, really? <laughs> really, Brilliant. yeah. I've been watching uh, Glitchy uh, and oh, Taz yeah. and, like, that whole scene, that whole crew. Um, and they just happen to be on uh, when I'm, like, able to watch something. So it's just kind of convenient that I can tune in and be like, I know these characters, you yeah. know, like, and I can see, like, some scenes by them. Um, so... So yeah, so that's honestly what I've been watching. I haven't been watching like stuff like content created by Hollywood. It's mostly been mm. been streaming. Yeah, yeah. I don't watch a lot of TV because um, I'm usually at my computer doing something else. But uh, yeah, when I do, I'm just kind of eh, can't really find anything I want to get my teeth into. So yeah, but yeah, Bridgerton being the ex one of the exceptions because I love it. I haven't watched that yet, Blanky. Is it good? Moon Knight. Oh. It's the new Marvel thing, is it, on Disney Plus? You know, I watched the first ep. I don't even know that I finished the first episode because I think I fell asleep. But I enjoyed. I enjoyed it. You know, it was. It's kind of different. Like, uh, it. It reminds me of like. Um, Doctor Strange meets Venom in a way. Like it's it's different, but it's it's got it's interesting. And I like the actor. I can't remember his name. Oscar something. I can't remember. Um <laughs> but yeah. Um so how's chat doing? Now we can talk to yeah. chat a bit more freely. Thank you so much, <laughs> uh Elite and um marty elite i am very interested to hear what you think of it uh thought of the book as well because you read it um so uh elite if you're still here if not i will try to tag you on in the discord to get your perspective uh i did Oscar want Isaac. to because i have the uh i've got the activity feed up now but um just because we haven't got any alerts and stuff. So uh, just to go through and say thank you to Soul Survivor, Lizard Nutter, Redline, uh, Supreme Steph, Still Kyle, and Somnic for the follows. That's awesome. Thank you very much. I love that. I love that. And I'm glad that people are finding us. Yeah, it's good. Uh, I know all of those people and they're all lovely. Um, Lizard Nutta, uh, I'm on season two of Game of Thrones for the first time, and I really like it. Oh man, to watch that oh. show for the first time again—that's yeah. a special treat. That's so good. I'd love to be able to do that. Yeah, it's really. I mean, I think 
if I started watching it again, I'd probably really enjoy it. Actually. Oh, I've watched it multiple times. It's it's yeah. still delightful. Yeah, it's still great. Um, and Marty, I appreciate you being here. Um, however, I don't do reading whatsoever. So <laughs> yeah, no, that's okay. I mean, I listen to podcasts where. <laughs> where I am not like the typical general audience for it. And I just enjoy the people, you know? Yeah, exactly. I watched, um, I watched the entire series about, uh, League of Legends esports. Oh, really? I've, I've never played League of Legends in my life. Yeah. But I really enjoyed the series. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. I don't know. I've attempted. But you drive a lot, though, Marty. Why don't you um, try like an audio book? Yeah. Um, could do an audio book, or uh, I mean, I listen to the podcast as well a lot. Oh yeah, podcasts as well. Yeah. But yeah. So we I'm... did announce the next book. Um, yes, we did. Yeah, we did, but. Uh, we can put them in the Discord, and yeah. if you wanted to, just tell them again what we're listening sure. to, what we'll be reading. Um, so we will be reading the Kaiju Preservation Society um, as our next fiction book, which will be uh, a month from now. We'll have that read, and then in two weeks we'll have a podcast uh, for a nonfiction book that we're going to read called Educated by Tara Westover. Exciting. Yeah. So that'll be good. Yeah. I'm trying to decide which one to to listen to via audiobook or one or you know to read physically. Mm. I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure actually. I think I might do educated by audio. I'm I'm tempted to do that one by audio. Yeah. But, it is twelve uh, hours yeah. and ten minutes long. Is that right? Which is quite a tall order in two weeks. Educated? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I listened to it's it also at only seven ninety nine on Audible, so I could actually oh, just buy it instead of using one of my credits. Instead of using the credit. Mm. Yeah. That is tempting. I just recently got uh, three credits because they were offering them at like 20% off. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I think they've got a they've got a, a sale on at the moment. I think there was some three quid books somewhere. Yeah, three pound sale, members only. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, there's some stuff in there I might buy. Yeah, definitely. Um, all right. Well, thank you to chat and to Claire, of course. Um, we'll be back. Um, I mean, if we think of something that we want to do between now and next week, we might stream again. But um, you never know. We might also be reading. <laughs> yeah, we might not have time to stream because we've got to read two books. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, uh, yeah, um, I guess until then, we'll catch you guys next time. Thanks again for the follows, and, um, yeah, have a good week. Happy reading. <laughs>